All right, if the Lord was to remove every spiritual blessing from your life, would you notice? Now, I want to be clear. God does not do this. Okay? He does not do this, but this is a thought experiment. If, if the Lord was to remove every spiritual blessing from your life, would you notice that? What would be missing? What, what, would, what would be lost in your life? Would you be aware of, when you think of the blessings of God, what comes to mind? Often, especially in the American church, we think of the blessing of God as, as our health and the, the material possessions we own, which those are blessings and good things to praise God for. But here's the problem. When we focus on the material and external blessings of God to the exclusion of the immaterial spiritual blessings. Because the reality is one day, all of these material possessions will be gone. Our health will fade. Our house will be gone. At the end of the age, God is going to make everything new. All of the physical blessings will go away. And I believe there's a problem, especially in the American church, where we focus on the external and material possessions to the exclusion of the immaterial and spiritual, that which is eternal and irrevocable. Today, we're going to begin a series called Lavish, where we're looking at the spiritual blessings that the Father has generously, extravagantly bestowed upon his children. And our hope during this series is as we look at a God who is so generous, that gratitude would begin to well up in our hearts and overflow in a generous life in the here and now. And today in particular, we're going to be looking at the gift of grace. That's where we're going today. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter one, but a little bit of background about the author of Ephesians before we get there. The author of Ephesians, a guy named Paul. Now, Paul's story was not always writing letters to churches and loving Jesus. In fact, Paul started out, he was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. He would have had lots of religious sway within the Jewish community, societal status within the culture of the day. This was a man who had clout and he hated Jesus. In fact, he wanted to squash the movement of Jesus in the first century. And he went with the authority of the chief priests to do so. They gave him authority to imprison and execute Christians. And while he's endeavoring to do this, to destroy the early church, he meets Jesus. And God, by his grace, Flip turns him upside down. He's like the original Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He, he goes from a guy who hates Jesus to a guy who loves Jesus. He goes from a guy who wants to destroy the church to a guy who's instrumental for building the early church. That's who we're learning from today. A man who deeply understood and experienced grace. And so we're going to be in Ephesians chapter one, starting in verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus. So Paul's writing this letter and he says, this is, he's an apostle by the will of God. This was not his idea, right? His idea, destroy the church, persecute Christians. Jesus flips his life around and gives him a new direction. Now he's an apostle. Think about all of the societal blessings Paul would have lost in following Jesus. As we, as we talk about the, the material and immaterial blessings of the world, he would have lost clout. He would have lost his religious standing as a Pharisee among Pharisees. He would have lost his societal blessings, but here he's going to unpack every spiritual blessing that he and you and I receive in Christ. So he's writing this letter to a church in Ephesus and he says, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. I wish you and I could take a spiritual tattoo gun and tattoo that on our minds and on our hearts. Let's read that again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Do you have this view of the Father? Do you see the Father God as this? What's his action towards us? Blessing. He gives gifts. 
often we have a view of the father as like a slightly improved version of our earthly father. But our heavenly father is not just an improved version of our earthly father. He is the perfect father. And his action towards us in Christ is blessing. And not just a one-time blessing. Look, he says, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms is yours from the father to you in Christ. Do you have this perspective of the father or have you taken the lens of your earthly father and kind of put it over who he is? It's very, very common, but here's why this is so important. If we don't understand who the giver is, we're not going to receive his gifts. And here Paul says, he blesses us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What would your life look like if you fully believed this in every aspect of it? That the father isn't some chintzy, kind of cheap, withholding, distant God who's like looking at the spiritual thermostat of your home and saying, no, let's bring that down a little bit too costly. That's not the father of heaven. The father God is lavish, extravagant. He has immense every spiritual blessing. In Christ. And now Paul's going to kind of unpack what some of those spiritual blessings are. He says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He says, you were chosen. And this isn't God just generally choosing a group of people. No, he called you by name. He said, I want you. And he called you for a purpose. You were chosen for a purpose, he says here, to be holy and blameless. And this is not a holiness that we have to try and create of our own. Remember, all of this is in him or in Christ. And so you're holy and blameless, not because you've done all the right things and you've avoided all the wrong things. You're holy and blameless only because of what Jesus has done and your faith in him. That in Christ, Jesus took your sin and gave you his righteousness on the cross. That's that great exchange that took place. And now you stand before the father God robed in Jesus's holiness, robed in his blamelessness, robed in his righteousness. That's how you stand before the father. And this all happened. This choosing happened before the foundation of the world, before the world began. God said, I choose you. In Christ, Wait, your whole life is bare before God. So it's not, it's not as though he chose you before the foundation of the world, but he, he sees you on a Tuesday evening, yell at your kid. He's like, I, I don't know about this. Maybe I'm going to reject them. No, no, this happens before the foundation of the world. It is an irrevocable choosing to be holy and blameless before him in love. So easy to just gloss over that. But the God who is love in Christ, his posture and actions towards you always flow from his love for you. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. There's a lot of language there, but what I want us to see is this idea of predestined for adoption. Predestined simply means to be predetermined or chosen beforehand. There's a spectrum of beliefs on how to interpret the idea of predestination, but I don't want us to miss the beauty of what Paul's saying here. You were predetermined, you were chosen beforehand that you might be adopted into the heavenly family. That should blow our minds because we don't deserve that. It did not suffice God to just pardon you as a subject in his kingdom. He said, no, I want you to be a child at the family dinner table. He invited you into intimate, deep relationship, just like a father has with their children. This is the blessing we receive in Christ. Adoption, being predestined for adoption. He chose you beforehand. In him, We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Now, now these verses is where we're going to kind of anchor our feet here in a moment. We're going to do some work in here. So I'm not going to dive too deep into them because this is where we're going to be for the remainder of the message. But I wanted us to have the full context 
of these beautiful spiritual blessings that Paul says are ours in Christ. Because that's where we're going for the rest of this series. And so he says, we are forgiven of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. That word lavish. When, when I was a, a teenager, my after school TV show was MTV Cribs, right? And if you don't know what that show is, you'd go, uh, they'd go into homes of celebrities, rock stars, movie stars, and you would just see their extravagant lifestyle. Lavish riches. I mean, gold plated bed frames and pools in the living room and cars that were worth hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Just lavish, lavish lifestyle. But the difference between the guys on MTV Cribs and our Lord is all of their riches were for themselves. Where verses here, he says he lavishes it on us with all wisdom and insight. God freely gives of the riches of his grace. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to, the purpose, to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So we're going to comb back through just a portion of this passage and dig into the idea of grace. Firstly, I want us to see our need for grace. The need we have, the deepest need of your life and my life is grace in Jesus Christ. And we have all kinds of needs coming at us every day, right? If you got kids, you got needs, okay? I got three of them. Well, we, we got needs, right? Dad, I want to, I'm hungry. Can I go outside? Dad, I want a yogurt. Dad, can I play the game? Dad, 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 dad. And it's just always coming at you. Or you know what your own needs are, right? If I don't eat before lunchtime, I'm probably going to be hangry and not a good human. If I don't sleep tonight, tomorrow I'm going to be grumpy and a bad human. We understand the idea of need. But do you feel the need for grace? Have you, do you understand that grace is the deepest need of your life, right? We value sleep and food because we see the need for those. If we don't see our need for grace, we're not going to value it. Let's go back to the passage here. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. It's an interesting way that Paul describes sins here. That's what he's talking about, the forgiveness of our sins, but he uses the word trespasses, And especially in this part of the county, you may think of trespasses as when you're out hunting and you come across the barbed wire fence because you come upon private property and it says no trespassing, no hunting beyond this point. But Paul says, look, God put up boundaries for our life. He put up boundaries, not to be a cosmic killjoy, but that that we might experience the abundant life of Jesus. He's given us boundaries. He says, if you go beyond this space into this area, you ought not to be outside of this boundary. It won't be for my glory and it won't be for your good. And so he's given us boundaries that we might experience the abundant life of Jesus. And here's what we've done with those boundaries. We've believed that abundant life, real joy, real peace, love, and acceptance exists outside of the boundaries God has given. And ever since the garden, we've been bulldozing boundaries, right? Isn't that what Adam and Eve did? God gave them one job. They had one rule. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge and evil. And, 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 it's, and they ate from it. Why? Because they saw, hey, maybe I could be like God. They believed God was withholding from them the abundant life. And when we look at those, those boundaries the Lord has set up, Paul says, We trespass. We often go where we ought not to go for our own, to to our own detriment rather. Several years ago, I was camping with the Ketchum family and uh, my son, he's not afraid of really anything um, except for vacuum cleaners, but he's not afraid of heights. He's the kid who will go right up to an edge and just dangle his feet off and like, mom, take a picture, you know, and he gives me a heart attack all the time. Well, we get to the camping spot and there's just big trees everywhere. And there's one tree that is clear. Kids have climbed all over. The branches are pretty bare. There's no bark. And uh, he said, dad, can I climb that tree? And I said, yes, but I gave him a boundary. I said, hey, bud, about this high up, it was probably 15, 20 feet off the ground. I said, look, I don't want you to go above that because the branches are bare and the, the tree is wet and you could slip and really, really hurt yourself. 
And so then I get set off with Shaughnessy setting up camp. And if you ever want to exercise in examining whether or not you're growing in the fruit of the spirit, try to set up tents in the rain with your wife. That's awesome. And so we're setting up tents. I'm totally distracted from what my son is doing. We finally get tents set up. And then uh, I ask my kids to set up their beds inside their tent. And I look to where Asher is. And he's not in the first 15 feet of the tree. I look at the branch that I told him to not go above. He's not there. He's like double the height up the tree. And everything in me screams like, he needs to get down. He's not safe. And so I try to calm down. I said, Asher, you need to come down and set up your bed. And we need to talk because you crossed the boundary. And so he starts coming down the tree. And I'm helping my daughters get their campsites, uh, their bed set up. And I hear a snap, a branch broke. And he falls four or five feet down, hitting a few branches along the way and catches himself. Why? Because the branches were bare and slick. And now he's crying and scared. He doesn't know how to get down. And so my wife climbs up the tree in her flip-flops and rescues our son. And as he got down, we had the conversation, daddy gave you a boundary for your good. And what it came to is he really thought fun was on the other side of my boundary. Is that not how we view the boundaries of God? That abundant life, joy, peace, love is really over here. Where are you tempted to cross the boundaries that God has given. That God says, maybe honor me with your, with your finances, but really you honor yourself. Or God says, flee from sexual immorality. That's such a strong statement, by the way. Flee, run the opposite way. But we dabble in websites we ought not to be on. What is it for you? God says that he wants his people to be honest and people of integrity. But a white lie doesn't matter. You see, for some, crossing the boundary begins with a little tiny compromise. And it begins to veer and eventually you're way over here. And for others, they just don't believe that God has the best interest for them. And so they just hop the fence. Where is it for you that you see the the boundary and say, God, there's better things on the other. I don't believe you. I want to cross. That's called sin. And sin requires grace. And sin is a big deal. How do we know that? Because it required blood. It required the perfect atonement, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus. Sin is not trivial. And so often sin is trivialized and made small. Oh, it's just a white lie. But if sin is small, grace is cheap. And grace is not cheap. The cross is the definitive statement about how serious sin is. So have you trivialized sin in your life? The sin debt that you and I cannot pay is our deep need for grace. Do you see your need? It's the deepest need of your life. But God was not sufficed to leave us in that need. He wanted to do something about it. And so he gave us the gift of grace. Let's look at it again in the passage. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he blessed us in the beloved. Can you not tell that Paul has experienced grace? Look at how he talks about it. So lofty and high and beautiful, glorious grace. But it begs the question, what is grace? Right In the New Testament, the word grace is used in a variety of ways. We just saw it at the beginning of the passage. He says, grace to you. And now he's using it in a very different way. So what is grace? Even in the English language, we use grace in varied ways, right? We might say someone on the, on the dance floor is graceful, or we sometimes use it in a pejorative way where somebody falls. Oh, that was graceful. So what does grace actually mean? Well, the word here for grace in the original language, charis, is how it's transliterated. If you don't know what transliterated means, it means the Greek alphabet is different from the English alphabet. And so to translate it into English, we use the closest letters to the original alphabet. Transliterated, it's charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. 
And so when I looked up the definition of charis, it's, it's God's loving kindness. It is a gift. It is favor with the Lord, a free gift of loving kindness and favor from the Lord. And so for our purposes here today, I want to define grace as such. Grace is unearned, undeserved favor with God. Unearned, which means we can't do enough before the Lord. We can't be holy enough on our own to get grace. We can't be holy enough and do enough good works to earn favor with God. Unearned. But it's also undeserved. There is nothing within you or I that made God want to give us grace. He gives grace because that's the type of God he is, not because of anything within us. I don't say that to shame anybody, but I say that to magnify the beauty of who God is, that he would give grace even to people who are rebellious sinners who are his enemies. That's the God that we serve. So grace is undeserved, uh, unearned, undeserved favor with God. And Paul kind of uses some more lofty, high language about grace. He says, in him, we have redemption. The idea of redemption is to be bought back with a price. That price was the precious blood of Jesus. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. And that phrase is so important. When we are forgiven of our trespasses and sins, it is in accordance with God's riches. It is not out of God's riches. It's not as though God has a spiritual bank account with you and you subtract from it every time you sin or trespass until you're 36 years old and you yell at your daughter and then your spiritual check bounces. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the forgiveness that you and I receive for our trespasses and sins is in accordance with the lavish riches of the grace of God. That's a beautiful language. Can, can you imagine what it would be like to live like that was true all the time. According to the riches is God's response to your failure, your sin, your trespass. In Christ, he responds to you with a, a, a grace according to the riches that he lavished upon us. Do you believe that? How would you know if you believed that or not? Well, when you fail, what is your response? When you blow it, when you sin, when you trespass, where do you go? Do you beat yourself up and go through, uh, you know, a, 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 the self-hatred phase where you beat yourself up for days before you come to God? Do you hide from God? Do you run away from God? Or in that moment where you fail, if you truly believe this, if I truly believed this, Every time I failed, I would run to the father saying, I failed. I need your grace. And he would forgive according to his riches. Can you imagine a life where this was always your posture before God when you failed? And he uses more beautiful language, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. That word lavished, it's usually used of a, uh, a, a, it's an adjective. It's usually used to describe something, right? The lavish lifestyles of the rich, right? But here he uses it kind of in a different way. He uses it as the verb that God does towards you and I in the midst, in, 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 because of our sin. He lavished upon us. It says, God is not chintzy and cheap and withholding. God is lavishing grace upon his people in Christ. And, he, and then he says, in all wisdom and insight, in some translations, depending on what translation you have, add this, uh, this uh, part of the sentence onto the grace that's given. Some translations add it onto the mystery of his will. But I think it makes more sense in the flow in context of the passage added on and describing the action of God lavishing upon us, that he lavishes it upon us in all wisdom and insight. And here's why I think this is so beautiful. God thought it wise and insightful, or another word there is prudent, to lavish grace upon sinners for their trespasses. God thought it wise to lavish grace upon us 
The wisest thing you and I can do when we sin is come to God. And God himself here says the wise thing to do because of what Christ did and our position in Christ is that he would lavish us with grace. Is that not just an awesome, glorifying, beautiful picture of who the giver of the gift of grace is? This is his desire to lavish his children with grace. Do you believe that? Or have you placed limitations on the grace of God? Have you said, yeah, God's grace is good, but it can't actually forgive this area of my life or this hiddenness in my life, or this from my past. There's an author and lawyer named Bob Goff. Here's a picture of him. And he's a gregarious guy. He's, he's fun loving. He comes into a room and everybody knows he's there. And he just loves people so well. And he was an honorary consul to Uganda. And, and he, uh, he heard about an atrocity really that's been happening in Uganda for a long time, where witch doctors would mutilate children because they believed there was some sort of magical property with, their, with the mutilated flesh of a child. And then they would leave the child in the brush to die. And they had never successfully prosecuted a witch doctor and put them into prison because of the fear of witch doctors and the power and sway they held in society. And Bob hears about this. And he hears about a case about a young boy named Charlie. Charlie was abducted by a witch doctor named Kabi. Kabi took him out into the brush and mutilated his gen- genitals, leaving them, him there to bleed out and die. Kabi takes the flesh back, does a ritual with it, and ch- leaves Charlie to die. Charlie, with lots of blood loss, somehow miraculously makes it back to, to his home and he's taken to receive medical treatment. He survives. And Bob, the lawyer, takes on this case as the prosecutor because now they have evidence. Charlie survived and he begins to prosecute Kabi and he wins the first successful case of a witch doctor in Uganda. Kabi was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. First time it's ever happened. And, and Bob began to build a deep relationship with Charlie so much so that he eventually adopted Charlie into his home. And as he comes back to the States and he's building this love relationship with this little boy who's now a part of his family, he, he, se- he feels his sense of anger towards Kabi grow. How could you do that to a child? Use your power against a, a helpless child. And then the words of Jesus were ringing in his head. Love your enemy. And Bob knew he needed to do something about it. So he flew back to Uganda. He went to the prison Kabi stayed at and he set up a meeting and he said in his own words, when Kabi came in, the first thing he was asking for was forgiveness. Now Kabi hadn't come to faith in Jesus, but he knew he needed forgiveness. And, and Bob sat down and explained to him how Bob was able to forgive Kabi and give him grace because Bob had received grace in his time of need. And it's a moment where the grace of God is meeting real depravity in humanity. And Kabi, in his uh, young excitement in the faith, he says, everybody needs to hear about this. I want all of the prisoners to know about the depth of the grace of God. And he didn't have all the words to speak it because he didn't understand all, all the truths of the scripture, but he knew Jesus had given him grace. And so he, he set out with Bob's help to create a sermon. And he wrote a sermon and he preached it before the prisoners. The prisoners who knew Kabi, who knew he was a witch doctor, who knew the power he used to hold in society, and who knew Bob, the guy who put him behind bars. And as the prisoners watched, these two men stand side by side as Kabi proclaimed the gospel of grace before them. God did an amazing, miraculous thing where many of them came to faith in that moment. Because God's grace, the gift of God's grace really does meet the grit of life, even for a witch doctor like Kabi. And Kabi's story should be so encouraging for us that God lavished grace even on him. And so certainly there's grace for you. 
Where have you disqualified yourself from grace? There is no sin that God's grace isn't far greater than. Where have you disqualified yourself from receiving the gift of grace? I love this quote. Uh, I found this online and I kind of altered it to fit our needs here today. But grace is the face of love when it meets imperfection. Grace is the face of love when it meets imperfection. The God who is love. When he comes face to face with your imperfection, his, his, his desire was not to condemn, but to save so much so that he sent his only son. The cross is not just the definitive statement about how serious sin is. It is also the definitive statement of how much God wants to give you grace. So much so that he gave his only son, the most valuable treasure in the universe. So have you received grace? Have you experienced grace? as Paul so clearly in his language has. You see, God is not just a subject to be studied. He's a person to be known. And if that's the case, how do we experience grace? Well, firstly, it's only in Christ. Look at it in the passage, in him. All through this passage, you see it peppered with in him, in Christ, in the beloved. That's because this is the only place that you and I can receive grace is in Jesus. Because he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus died taking our sin, drinking the cup of God's wrath, every last drop of it. And because of that, and he, 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 he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. In that great exchange, he gives us his righteousness. And so grace is only found in Jesus, because he's the one who dealt with our sin debt once and for all. And so if you don't know Christ, if you're here just checking out Jesus, I implore you, come to the God of the universe who has riches of lavish grace to give you. But maybe you're a follower of Jesus and you say, okay, I've experienced grace, but I, how do I continue to experience grace? These are a couple of thoughts from my own life. This is not from the passage, but I pass these on to you as things that have been very helpful for me in my endeavor to live in grace. Firstly, it's through confession. Through confession. Some of the moments where I have experienced the grace of God and his love wash over me afresh were when I came to my wife and said, I have sinned against you and I've sinned against God and I can receive the grace of God afresh. We receive grace through confession. Confession is not what saves us, but as followers of Jesus, we're called to bring sin and darkness into the light. And as we do that, it's met with the grace of God. So through confession and another from my own life is recognizing and replacing lies. You're never going to experience grace from God if you believe God is not gracious. You're never going to experience the grace of God if you believe that he's withholding and chintzy and cheap and distant and far off. You're never going to experience it. Why? Because those are lies. And we have this tool called Fruit to Root. If you need access to that tool, please put it on your Connect card. We will get it to you. Um, but it's the whole process of uprooting lies that we believe about God and fully embracing the truth that we might experience grace. I'm going to release to the campus pastors. Love you guys.